You know, I have three of the most amazing granddaughters ever, ever, and they know it. <laughs> and they're very confident about how their grandma loves them. I'm so thankful that the girls are with me when I'm here in Mexico. And fortunately, some are going to return to me as we get ready to go on the mission trip. And then the rest will be joining me not too long after. But I was thinking about that song and I'm going to just call upon the girls. I know you can't see them. I could have them come over and squat down here so you could see them, uh, but I don't know that they really want to do that. I guess I'll say it's up to you girls. But God has been performing amazing miracles, amazing. Mm -hmm. And even in the midst of our greatest nightmare, when we think that he doesn't see us or maybe things aren't going the way we want them to, he's always behind the scenes 
working things out for our good. One of the main things I had said for a long time was that my massive concern for my oldest granddaughter, we call her Joy because she's a joy of our heart, is that with the accident, she was in every day, 24 hour a day pain. And we just kept looking for answers and hoping somehow that some of the pain would be relieved so she could get some rest. And she pushes through it all. She doesn't stop working for God and doing the things for the Lord. But for seven years, this child, and I am going to have you come over here, Jocelyn. You can just kind of share my cedar. This young lady is my heartbeat. She was my very first oldest, and she likes to rub that in people's face. She is the joy of our heart, but her accident really took a toll on all of us, but more so on you. And to see her go through seven years of absolute pain was more than your grandma could take at times. And I know it was more than you could take, and I know your parents felt the very same way. But remember I kept telling you before we go on our mission trip, we're gonna go somewhere and find you help. Right. Mm -hmm never realizing that the help was right here mm -hmm. in the country and the area that we live in. Right. So can you share with them a little bit about, not necessarily the accident, but the testimony of your journey through the pain? Whew, it's <laughs> a long time. Mm -hmm. um, well, seven years, as she said, it's been a very long time, but you know, just waking up and going on daily, you know, and you're just gonna be in pain and doing what and knowing that you still have to get up put a smile on your face even though it's something that you don't want to do but because you know you have a work to do for god it was just something that i said no i have to push through this i have to fight whatever it is to just keep pushing forward and as she said she did say we were going to go to a country and find some type of remedy or anything like that so we could at least be not 100% pain free, but something that we know we can just wake up in the morning and we can just feel a little relief. And when we found Dr. Um, Dr. Ada, she's just been a lifesaver. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The medicine that she uses, cause I'm not one to take medicine. I was very skeptical, but the medicine that she uses is, um, it's helped so well. And it's actually not pills, it's yes. actually IV. It's something that actually just goes through the vein, through my vein and you can feel relief the minute it just starts coming through your body. And it's something that I never thought would happen, but I guess I'm very skeptical in the medicine. After thing. what you've been through, yeah. yeah. But um, what, she, what, what she did was just so miraculous. I remember the first time that I got this IV through the vein. It was like, wow, I don't know <laughs> what this is, what this relief is, but this is just like, oh my goodness. And um, I was I was very impressed. I thank God every day for letting Ada come into our lives Amen. because yes. she, mm -hmm. what she does is just amazing. And I'm, I mean, I can't say I'm 100% pain free, but what I am free of pain is just, I give God glory every day because it is something that I have been waiting for for seven years. And yes. for me to just finally be able to have some type of relief, it's it's amazing. <laughs> and I think that important to know that Ada is a chemist, scientist. Uh, a, a geneticist. A geneticist. So she doesn't use with, you know, regular medicine. She mm -hmm. goes to the lab and whatever our illness is, our problem is physically, they go in there and they do a designer medication for our specific needs. Right. And she's known Jocelyn as long as I have. As about my, three years. About yes. three years. Yeah, I said, not as long as I have. I've known you all your life. But, uh, so she's seen what Jocelyn has gone through. And this new therapy is very new. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's coming out of what country, Jocelyn? It's coming straight right here, out of here. Mexico, Mexico yeah. yeah. Mexico, but, Canada, and I believe it was Is it Switzerland? Cambridge. 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 Okay, but I'm saying the, the studies themselves. Oh, so Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. In Switzerland, they fine-tune this 
therapy. Mm -hmm. They don't want to use it on us Americans because, you know, big pharma, we kind of have a lot of problems if all of us didn't keep coming back to the doctors and the medicine and all of this. Mm -hmm. But didn't you find, I know you and I got the same pain treatment the same day. Mm -hmm. Didn't you find it amazing that you didn't have any like fogginess of your mind? Oh yes. It was, it was as soon as the pain medicine came through, it was just like something just switched on in your brain and you could think more clearly and it's not something I have to, look, well, hang on, let me think about this several times before I have to, before I do it. It was just immediately like something switched on. And I think the beauty of it was is that I was like you, very skeptical. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm bringing this in is because it has a lot to do with our mission and our testimony. I knew that this sweet baby, I know you're not a baby anymore, but can you okay. probably still say that? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> is a part of my life. And she loved to rub it into all the other grandchildren's face. I'm the first and I'm the best and I'm the one that she loves the most. And she's said that for so long. I think she's just about got all of them brainwashed. I'm not really sure. She said I might have to brainwash a few more of them. But the point is, is that seeing what God was doing, and I knew that she was going to be a great part of our board. And she's been so diligent to learn and apply herself in the midst of the pain. And I don't know sometimes how you learned because your mind was so overwhelmed. But she did not stay on pain medication and narcotics. She removed herself from that. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't here pumping pain pills. She was just enduring. And to me, that speaks volumes. But she didn't want a bunch of mind problems or... Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the biggest fear of taking drugs that the United States gives us? I know I well, you see how people act there. It's it kind of like puts them in like a zombie mode. So oh, it's yeah. like I don't want to if I have a mission to do for the Lord, I'm not going to be under all those narcotics and not be able to give my 100 percent for God. So as soon as I got out of the hospital, I knew I was like, OK, I might take my pain medicine once every so often, but I'm not going to take it to where I'm just more mummy and zombie, zombified than anything else. So it's just, I knew I had a work to do for God and I was like, no, medicine, pain medication is not going to be something I'm going to be stuck on for the rest of my life. And I want to tell you what, a lot of us want to take the easy way out. But Jocelyn, when you were first coming out of the fact that you could never walk again and you were in that situation, I know there were times you felt like giving up. Oh yes, but, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't in uh, every day when I thought to myself, "Well, why am I just? Why am I still here? Why am I just existing right now? If I know I'm not going to be able to walk or move as I was before my accident, and I know my mom, my mom was always like, "No, you're going to get up. You're going to move. You're going to have to to push forward." Because if not, you're just going to be stuck here in the bed. And it was like, even though I got, it wasn't because I got angry at my mom. It was, I was angry at the situation of yes. how it was. Yes. And she helped me push me 30 days, <laughs> 30 days of get up, get moving, get pumping because you're going you're to walk. You just, that's something you're going to do. Even when the doctors gave up all hope and my mom's like, no, this is what you're going to do. You have no option. So... <laughs> If it wasn't for God and pastor and the family, I don't think I would be as far as I am now. <laughs> and I think the future is even brighter. I, you can't see her mom. Her mom helping run the system back <clears throat> here. But uh, Barry, talk about just briefly how hard it was to watch your daughter go through this and have to push her through the pain. I mean, if you want to come up here where she's at so they can see you, that's fine too. Uh. It, it, it is really hard, and I'm sure that, I'm sure okay, that... Okay, just come on over here by your daughter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, kind of, we'll be around um, our little group here. For, a, for as a parent and uh, three important people in my lives, there was in a major accident, because like I said, my sister could have been gone, Jocelyn could have been gone, Christina could have been gone. That's That's... Part of your family you know that's your heartbeats you're, that's the ones you love and no i might i know there's people out there that have lost physically lost a child but i almost i was almost there and to knowing that my child could never walk or do anything for herself again i had to make up in my mind i had the determination oh you will push through everything no matter what pain you are going through and to 
to have your life. You're still young. You still have a, a work to do. And and I know without God, she wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Without God, she wouldn't be alive. She wouldn't be walking. She might have slight handicaps, but she don't let that hold her down. She don't put that as a hindrance for her like some people would. And she don't brain it herself pity party no matter what she's going through she still pushes forward she presses beers through everything and and i have to be that mother i'm gonna keep putting that rod in your back and you will keep going she's like well I'm, i heard i'm tired i'm sleeping okay but well, we still gonna go i'll let you rest for a little bit but we're gonna start back over and we're gonna keep doing it again yeah. so you know to have a uh family a team i, I said this family team right here we take care of each other we love each other we know god can do many miracles in lives we done seen so many that god done healed and blessed and some of us don't even deserve it but you know i just thank god that we can be that blessing she every day i look at her i know he can do it for her he can do it for somebody else so which keeps me encouraged it should also keep you encouraged that you know god can do all things Okay. He can turn every situation around if we just put our trust in him. The song said, I will trust you, Lord. And when we put our trust in him, he can turn everything around. As long as we do what we need to do for him. Mm -hmm. now, I know you guys are bent down kind of hard, so I'm going to help you guys get up. And I wanted you to hear that because that's love. Love goes beyond the boundaries. And I told him we were still going to sing that song, but I think we'll let it slide for right now. We may not. We may do it towards the end of the service. Trusting God. We're not on speaking terms. You hear people say, I'm not on speaking terms with someone. I just don't communicate well. The biggest part of any relationship is trust. What if you're interactive with a person and you don't trust them? There's a barrier of fear. There's anxiety. There's uncertainty. But the biggest hurdle is being able to communicate your heart. Talking to God is one of the most important things you will ever do in your life. As we look back in this last few weeks, because we arrived here uh, February the 28th, and we were in my doctor's office the very next day. And I was like Jocelyn, very skeptical. You know, I knew that I had a mission to do for God, but I didn't feel like I could really do it. And I wasn't about to start something I could not complete. I don't want to go out and do what I do for the Lord and then feel like I've got to have hours and days of rest and recuperation. So as we've come now into the second week, and I have had actually two treatments, because of the five surgeries and all the health problems that I was suffering from the accident and stress and all the things that's happened over a period of about 20 years, I needed a little extra boost than Jocelyn. And I was extremely weak in my hands, very difficult for me to walk. And, and I know that you all in my church in the States and here, you already see a massive difference. I'm almost back to me. And that means watch out, because we're on a run. My son over here would say, I'm just not used to you walking so slowly. You would always outwalk us, and I couldn't keep up with you. And I told him, that day's coming again. He's sitting there smiling like, yeah, I'm already seeing it on the horizon. But I really knew that we had a mission that we must do for God. And it's the most important mission of a lifetime. To bring his presence to an entire globe is the most important thing. And I don't care what your naysayers or your things you want to say. I don't, I don't care. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in staying focused on what God wants and how he wants to move. But I knew that in my physical condition, that was quite complicated. When I got to Dr. Ada, and she first told my granddaughter before I got here, she said she really needs to have at least three treatments because of what she's been through physically over the last years in order to put things back into place. And because the way that this medicine works, I don't really know whether to call it medicine, it's really science. Uh, it just goes back in and rebuilds every cell in your body and reorganizes everything from your mind to the bottom of your feet. I was still wondering, am I gonna be able to walk? I couldn't even open jars. I would have to turn to one of the children and say, do you mind opening this for me? Do you mind? doing this for me because I didn't have strength. Walking across the floor was just a really great effort. 
when my back surgeon said to me, I need you walking 30 minutes a day, nonstop, I knew that that was not going to happen. I didn't have that strength. But I knew the mission that God has me on was far superior to anything that anyone could comprehend. And that I knew that God had not taken me out of this life and that I must fulfill the quest that he's placed in my hands. I love my church, my church family. I adore every one of them. They're all unique in their own crazy way. And even coming here, I have made sure that they've gotten vitamin boosters and detoxification and things for them to make this journey with me. And I know you guys in the state say, well, we haven't got ours. That's okay because Dr. Ada is going to meet us and continue to help us with the treatment that the rest of you was not able to get. So I'm reassured of that. She's amazing, she's intelligent. I can't say enough about how God put her in our life and has used her so instrumentally to help me and to help my family. So this is not an advertisement for Dr. Ada. It to me is a verification that God had it all worked out before I even knew it. I met Dr. Ada about three years ago. She came to our school briefly before our school got thrown out in the streets, but it never stopped our relationship with her. And I see a woman that is so kind and so loving and compassionate towards people and does not like to see their pain. She likes to see that they're made whole. This to me is a true ministry in itself, caring about humanity more than you love about yourself. We all have great deal of pain in this life, especially in our community. I read and shared with my group last night the poisons that are in some of the foods. And I don't know if everybody on our group chat got that. And it's an internal group chat, so you wouldn't obviously get it on the outside unless I had them post it. But the poisons that are in our food is what's killing us, causing extreme pain. When you have extreme pain, you don't feel like praying unless you're asking God to help you and screaming out for mercy. You just don't have it. When your spiritual and your natural men are off balance, you can't seem to get it in check. And these impurities and these poisons that are introduced into our body constantly affect us and produce the cancers and the diseases. So when Dr. Ada, I talked to her about different members of our family and told her what each one had been through, she made sure that they got a detoxification to start getting those chemicals out of the body so that they could get on a better level for the future and what we were handling in just the months ahead. We may not like to change our diet. We may like the things that we eat because it's addictive. It's very good and tasty, but we have to look at it that uh, we can't do that. We just can't do it. And it really depends on your quality of life. How well do you want to live this life is how well do you want to take care of your body? Many of you know that we are not Jewish. However, we do keep some of the dietary laws, probably most of them. Uh, there may be a few I don't know of, is why I said maybe most of them. We don't eat pork. We don't eat unclean. We do not eat fish that is not correct. We don't eat scallions and uh, crawdads and all of the stuff that down in the south and parts of the states eat because these are actually scavenger foods. They're not healthy for us. And we don't eat bacon and we don't eat sausage and we don't do these things and that. And it's because it's in the Bible for us not to. Inside the animals and even the vegetables that we're eating, there's chemicals that's causing us to develop a barrier against it and us to become very ill. You know, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I will soon be 68 and I make mention of it because to me it's a miraculous event that I've lived this long. But I don't wanna live this part of my life being dependent upon medicine and just trying to function. I wanna be self-sufficient and capable to do whatever God leads me to do. In my journeys, when all this happened with the accidents and of course the murder of my son and the sudden death of my mom and my husband within 10 months of each other's massive, massive things, it didn't let up. And I remember my personal assistant, who's my daughter, she said, you've just lived through so much for so long. It does wear on you stressfully, but my faith and trust in God never wavered, never. I always knew my life was in his hands and whatever he chose for me, I would submit to that. You see, when we become God, we decide we're going to control our destiny. We're going to make our plans for our success. 
We're going to make our plans for our relationship. We're going to make our plans for what we want in this life. But in fact, that's not why we were brought to this life. I was born and brought to such a time as this so I could lead you into the presence of God. That's what my destiny is. Fame, riches, glory, not interested. I don't care what you offer me. Only God is what I want. I thought about the children of Israel. Here they were in bondage and captivity for so many years and they couldn't break free. And here Moses, their leader, was not doing such a good job of leading because here he was put into Pharaoh's house and yet he committed unpardonable by killing. He had to flee for many years. I mean, this was not a young man leading the children, the obstinate children of Israel across that desert. But God gave him a mission and that mission he was determined. He never felt adequate. When God's called you to do something, you will never feel adequate. If you do, you're too full of pride. You're too full of yourself. God has given me a great amount of ability, but at any second that could be gone. But my trust and confidence in him will not be shaken. I know him, I love him, and I serve him. When you're thinking about you're going across your, get ready to make your exit out of bondage. I've talked to you about prayer. I'm going to talk about making the exit out of bondage. You need to understand there are some life changes you must make. Because some of the things that you're involved in, whether aware of it or not, are influenced by the demons of hell. And their only desire is to stop you from serving God. And they do it by nasty habits, smoking, drinking, partying, carousing around, living carelessly. This is a good pleasure. You make Satan so happy. I'm pretty sure he's having his victory dance every second that you screw up. Every minute that you mess up, he's just down there shouting. And all the time you're trying to tell God what to do. The first thing you really must do is examine your life and ask yourself, who do you need to push back from being involved with you? Because there's an evil influence around people. Oh, they have a charismatic personality. They've got all kinds of unique things about them. But what are they really underneath the surface? So when you're starting your journey out of bondage, you're going to do just like God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. You take what you can take. He didn't say, bring everything you possess because we're going on a journey. But they didn't know if they were going to be one day, 10 weeks. I mean, the distance that they were traveling in today's comparison is very short, but it took him 40 years to get out of there because the murmuring, the griping, the complaining, finding fault with Moses and the leadership, this was a very long journey, and yet God still brought them through. Although that generation ended up dying in the desert, the generation who saw the miracles did hold fast. But when Moses told him that when the trumpet sounds and the death angel passes, you got to walk out that door. He didn't say, you got this week, that week, that many months, this many years. He says, you have to go because he knew what was going to happen. There was only a window of opportunity. And they knew that Pharaoh would get over his grief and be then in anger and come after the children of Israel and with vengeance to destroy them. There was a lot of people that had to make an escape. In your journey, you need to say, God, I'm yours. Anytime, anywhere, instantaneously. It's not about my plan of what I want to do. It's about how can I be used of you? How can I be a benefit to mankind in the things I do, the positive, the uplifting and leading? That's what you should be doing. The laughing, the gaiety, all that has its time and place, but that should not be your lifestyle. I see people get so enthralled about getting engaged, but they should not be getting engaged. If God is not first in your life, don't be getting with anybody. I've said so many times, people who walk of the same faith, of the same faith, not of a denomination. So let me clarify. My faith is not yours. My faith is in trusting in God and living according to the Old Testament. Not all of the Old Testament was given by God. So I don't go by every single chapter, but I do pay attention to the stories behind it. 
Your idea should be, God, here I am. I'm trusting in you. I submit. It doesn't matter if I'm wealthy, if I have to sell everything I've got. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. That man can know who you are. You've got to change your attitude. And you've got to change your goal and your purpose. You've lived all your life for you. How's that working? I don't know about you, but it hadn't worked all that great for those that I know. I have to bring about a miracle that has, is happening even as we've been experiencing this week. The young man who came to our church and was here with us a, a few months and had left and returned to, I want to say really he returned to the cartel without really meaning to. I think he just had this idea that it had been going so good he was invincible. But he came back to Mexico after I told him not to. Don't go back to Mexico. Stay in the safety of God. Stay where you need to be. And he didn't cause a big ruckus, but he just decided to leave and come back to Mexico. It took him a few months to get here. When he got back to Mexico, the cartel took him and beat him merciless, branded him. And this week he contacted me. And I know you might be li listening and I don't want to call your name out. But when I heard from him, I was so happy. He said, I'm so sorry. I should have listened. I just got so full of myself that I made all the wrong decisions. You have been like a grandmother to me. You only cared about my well-being. And so through our conversation, if everything works out in God's timing, he'll be back with us very shortly and he will be back on the road to what we needed to do. He's a wonderful young man. I love him with all of my heart. But you see, I couldn't be a part of his sin. I couldn't be a part of that lifestyle. He's learned a very, very, very hard lesson. He said he didn't realize when I said you'd be put in the hands of the devil that he was going to be put right there. Your way, how's it working for you? Your ideas, how's it working for you? Your impulsivity, how's that working for you? You see, again, the basis of our life is the food that we ingest. I've told my group, get off the junk food, get off the sodas, quit the fast food convenience store junk because it's just going to kill you and still going to break you down. And I've still been ignored. And unfortunately, they're the ones who's going to end up paying through their physical being. But thinking about how God has worked in this young man's life and how he's on his way back to us, I rejoice in that because he realized that stepping outside of God really wasn't worth it. It really wasn't worth the torture. And what he said to me in the text was, I owe God everything for he allowed me to live again. You see, the cartel had one time took Machete and sliced him and he didn't think that he was gonna have any more trouble but that's not how evil works. You see, evil says, I'll destroy you, and I'll make sure that your soul is destroyed completely. Your life has no, no purpose and meaning. That's not God's plan. God never does anything to hurt and destroy you. You do that. Your actions bring that out. And what is the main reason? It's because you're not on communication terms. You're not on good communication terms. You don't talk to him about the things that bother you. You just act out and explode and, and do all these things. And, and that doesn't bring a calm in your soul. So I want you to think today, as I'm talking about these events, many times you'll know I don't necessarily pull open a Bible. It just depends if I want to talk to you as my church, try to lead you through these waters or whatever God leads me to do. I do want to make a few statements in regards to my faith and what I believe. I believe there is one God and only one God. I don't need your rhetoric about how Jesus is God because that's a lie. That's a bald faced lie. And I've said many times, just go to the ecumenical councils. It's the Catholic doctrines. You can go to the Catholic Vatican archives and you will see that way after this supposed crucifixion of Jesus, they started putting a book together to control your life. That's how come you ended up with a whole lot of inconsistencies, just as I have. 
But in Nicaea Creed Council, they determined whether Jesus was to be called God or the Son of God or the substance and all this stuff. You will never read that. But for some of you who have contacted me personally in text, start at the ecumenical councils. And I do want to insert here, I made reference to Wikipedia. Now, for all of you people who don't have a brain, let me tell you why I made reference to that. Yes, I do know that Wikipedia is editable, and I do know that people can input many things, but it gives you enough keywords in that document for you to run reference in other places, especially going right to the Catholic Church. All of the Christians have aligned themselves with the Mark of the Beast and the Catholic Church. You took the Catholic doctrine out of the Council of Nicaea and the ecumenical councils involving Constantine and his crazy belief system, and you followed the Catholic Church and you called yourself a Christian. You're not a Christian. If you followed Jesus, he followed God. People say his name is not Jehovah, his name is not this, his name is not that. I just call him Adonai because it means the Lord. But don't get tripped up over what words were created because of translation issues. I don't use the word Elohim. I don't prefer to use it. That's just my preference. So you can get saying how many times this word was made. And yes, I know Jesus is not the translation, original translation that the, the English version has for his name. J does not exist in the Hebrew language. So the name Jesus that you're praying to is not even in existence. So you're calling upon a non-existent individual. I'm glad I found out that many years ago that we need to call upon the one and only, the true God of Israel, the God of our life and our soul. I'm not here to expound a great deal on this. I have many things to do for me to begin to leave in about 30 days on our mission. And I know that through those things, we'll have to hit and miss what we can. We're extremely busy right now. But for those of you who have contacted me by text, it's not that I can't answer your questions. It's that I have a big, big responsibility of preparing us to leave three parts of the country here in Mexico and the United States and other things that's on our agenda. So I recommend very strongly that even though you say, I don't use Wikipedia, use it as a guideline to find out what the words are. You don't have to use it as your primary source. I don't. I go and use the words I see and then I run the people involved. I look up what that's about. I try to use mostly university material, historical information, not just an article out of somebody's magazine. If you wanna know the truth, then be diligent about looking it up. I've made the statement, the first five books of the King James Version of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are the five books of the Torah, which are supposed to have been written by Moses, or at least information provided. That's a very good foundation. There are many things that you will find that are not necessary anymore, but I'm not here to teach you the difference of that. But the holy days of God he set into place. And what we are facing in just the weeks ahead of us is Passover. Passover is actually an eight day feast because it includes the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you start on sundown, look it up on your computer. I think it's the 5th of mm -hmm. April, mm -hmm. sundown, and it goes for eight days. During that eight days, especially after the first day, you cannot have leaven in your bread which means no yeast, and you can look all that up. You don't have to have me teach it to you. Use your mind, at least. My dad used to say for something other than a hat rack. Use your brain and look up what was considered leaven and unleavened. It tells you that you're supposed to clear it out of your house. I try to put all of mine in my garage because I don't go into my garage. So look at your boxes and see what's got it in there. But do your own research. Don't take my word for it. But the second holiest day of all is Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is an eight-day period. That you must keep. It's not an option. God required it and still requires it for us to keep it. And I'll go another step for all of you who want to follow Jesus. He kept the Passover. And you dropped it and called it communion. That was a Catholic trick. 
worked out really good, didn't it? Everything that God had set into place, Catholicism, the mark of the beast, the Antichrist came in to destroy so that you would not know God or have him in your life. The next important thing that's becoming on the horizon, by the way, we do not celebrate Easter. We have nothing to do with Easter. There are times the two holidays deliberately overlap, and that was designed by the Julian calendar and the ecumenical councils so that they could kind of still trick you into observing one or the other. But the gaiety involved in Easter is completely fertility and goddess worship. I do not serve but one God. You serve many. You that are Christians and celebrate Easter, you worship many gods. If you went in and saw it at the time written in the Bible when Jesus was being prepared for crucifixion, they were already celebrating Easter. It's in there. Just type in Easter. I think it comes up in about the book of Acts. I can't recall now. They were already observing it. Jesus wasn't dead. They've been doing that for many, many years. So you jumped on board and embraced everything that you were told. Time to wake up. Time to step back. Time to evaluate. When your spiritual life becomes aligned with God, God works miracles and miraculous things happen in your life. Stop straddling the fence trying to decide. Our next most important holy day comes and it's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That God requires of us, a day of repentance. Christian world doesn't even observe either one of those and yet they are demanded and required by God. And you went, just like you did the commandment of to remember to keep the Sabbath holy. You're so pagan and so foreign to God, it's terrifying. So far removed from God. And I'm going to insert here, I do not pray for everyone. I do not go to everyone's home. As a matter of fact, I refuse to pray for those who don't honor God because let the curses that he's already placed on you become brought fast into place. So maybe you'll wake up and humble yourself before him. I've given you a lot of information. I was trying to think if there was anything else that I wanted to tell you. I want to say back that with this mission and I'm rejoicing today Every minute, every hour, I'm getting stronger. And I cannot tell you how great that is. I don't want to hear anybody in my group tell me, you're going to do this. Uh, you're going to do that. You're going to leave here. You're going to do whatever. I want you to say, as the Lord wills, if this is the will of God, then I will fulfill his request. Not, well, I want, I want, I want. God doesn't really care about what you want might be a shock you do but you see he's got 7.8 billion people to draw to him Whew, that's a lot so your little bitty idea of what you want is really insignificant i look back over all the years that i've served the lord and i can say there's very few times i've ever prayed and asked god to do any specific thing i say lord give me grace in my injury and in my Illness, God, give me grace. Let me the example of your righteousness. Help me, give me strength. Lead me and guide me so that I can be what I can be. My very best for you. That's really the bottom line, my very best for you. So today, ask yourself who you're talking to. Are you having communication with God yourself or is Satan constantly putting those little suggestions and ideas in your head and you're picking up on them. When the scripture talks about controlling your mind, girding up the loins of your mind, quit letting your mind get catched off by a song, a movie, a, a story, an article. Keep your mind pure. You don't need all of that trash in there. Our bodies and our minds are little massive computers and we retain most everything we see and hear. So who are you going to be listening to? I would strongly suggest that you start listening to him. He didn't create me to worry. He didn't create me to fear. He just asked me to trust him. And that's very easy to do. I'm not concerned about tomorrow or how it's going to come and play. Just concerned about being my best that I can reflect his goodness to you and to this world. I thank you for every time you tune in I know that many of you have not seen all that we have seen behind the scenes. 
that's not time to come yet. You all will see it. It's not that far down the road. And to be a part of that is the greatest, most amazing journey of a lifetime. For 3,000 years, God has not been with the people. And now to know that he's coming in to be among the people in pureness, holiness, and righteousness. Keep your mind pure of evil thoughts. I don't find that conversation glorifying to anyone, and I'm pretty sure God doesn't either. Well, thank you. I always close by saying this is the Sabbath. This is a Sabbath. Started yesterday at sundown and ends today at sundown. The time that God set aside for us to acknowledge him, remember him, be with our loved ones, and share his wonderful testimony. Thank you for watching, and we will see you again.